else here? I missed any, if I missed anybody else, I'm very sorry. Um, I just want to say uh, the history, that what's brought us here today. Um, in 2006, believe it or not, etc we said we can do better and one of the best things and I've been around believe it or not almost 30 years but one of the best things that ever happened that I was involved with and Peter Capano was at I think everyone we had 19 public meetings and we said listen we want to come up with a new waterfront and, and pardon my back but you can see the green area that is there um, and we said, we can do better, right? And so we asked the public, what do you want on the waterfront? Those 19 public meetings led to the uh, passage of the master waterfront, uh, uh, master waterfront plan. So that went into effect. That led to new zoning, which was passed, which somebody could come in and build by right, uh, mixed-use development there today. Um, so that happened. That was in 2006. Simultaneously, the green area, excuse my back one second. This is Revere, the bridge. All of this area that's green, primarily it's green because power lines hug the coast. So as we were coming up and saying to the public, what do you want there? We were also saying, we've got to remove the, uh, the obstacle, which were the power lines. We came up with $6.5 million, took those power lines, and moved them to the other side of, of the Linway. So government's role, we set the vision with all of your input, we removed the obstacle, and uh, the other thing that happened simultaneously, about 2009, I believe, we filed and passed with the state, city council voted and filed with the state, a municipal harbor plan, which also um, is helpful in developers and development. Okay, so all of that led us to kind of the final piece, which is the open space, which is what we're talking about. Any development, any development that happens on the water, it's guaranteed that public access occurs. So it's critical. So if somebody were here today saying, I want to build mixed use apartments there or whatever, there has to be uh, public access along the waterfront. So um, the city doesn't own any land there. It's all private property. Uh, EDIC owns where the ferry is going. So EDIC owns that lot. Outside of that, it's 100% owned by, by the private parties. So that led us to the state, and I'm going to introduce Kurt. Where is Kurt? Over here from the state. He's a nice fellow, so it'll be nice to him. Um, no, but we want your input. So when we're talking about development, it's critical not just to have a bunch of buildings, right? But I've, I'm born and raised here. I'm a Lynn, Lynn product. I've never gone down behind like building 19. What's there, right? So this is an opportunity to enjoy, similar to the Linshore Drive where, where the public enjoys, right? This is an opportunity to have development, but it's an opportunity for you to say, what do you want um, to happen with this open space? So that's the history. I was supposed to speak for two minutes uh, and introduce Kurt from the state who is our partner. Kurt. So, uh, good evening everyone. Kurt Gertner, I have the privilege of working for Secretary Beaton at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, I manage a program called Gateway City Parks and am the Secretary's designated to something called the Lynn Lead Team, both of which are relevant to, uh, to this evening's conversation. And I would say, echo something Jim just said, which is I believe we're all here because of an opportunity. So Lynn has the opportunity of a wonderful waterfront site. Uh, waterfront not being something that every city can claim. And what I view this is as an opportunity uh, to basically focus on that resource and decide how it can be best used to provide uh, for the future of the city of Lynn. The uh, administration has... Ah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, and uh, one of the reasons I'm here this evening is that the Baker Polito administration, uh, working with Mayor Kennedy, Senator McGee, and others, has chosen to convene something called the Lynn Lead Team, an opportunity for s state government, federal government, uh, and others to basically work with the city landowners to advance economic development and revitalization in the city of Lynn. And the opportunity that my office, Energy and Environmental Affairs, had to contribute to the cause is to help the city think through its open space opportunity on the waterfront. From in the 305 acres you can see behind me, uh, from the Edwards Bridge to the Hot Causeway, you have about one and three quarter mile of waterfront opportunity an opportunity also to think through the open space that you want to provide in that zone. Open space that will matter a lot to the future of the uh, residents in that area and will matter a lot to the rest of the citizens of the city of Lynn. It's essentially a chance, an opportunity as development occurs in that 305 acres uh, to get it right, to make sure that as development occurs parcel by parcel across the waterfront that the recreational open space, the kind of things that really make for a good city uh, are realized uh, as those as those developments occur. Uh, I also want to uh, recognize that the Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, has a couple of pieces of land that are part of this zone. They're represented this evening by Patrice Kish and the uh, there are two opportunities here. There's the Lynn Heritage State Park uh, on the uh, end, sort of toward the end near Nahant, as well as a couple of holdings uh, near the Edwards Bridge. Part of the process today will be to think through uh, and to uh, begin to plan for the revitalization of those resources as well. Uh, we, we know we have a couple of pieces of land uh, and a heritage state park that can contribute more uh, and this would also be a process to look at some of the design and revitalization of those uh, resources. So uh, one other thing to mention is that the uh, process to revise your harbor plan will follow an effort that we're beginning tonight. So this is a uh, effort to look at the open space in the waterfront, to plan for it, to provide access to it, to ensure that uh, people from all over the sea can get to the waterfront and take advantage of those opportunities. This will also be uh, a, the beginning of the thinking through of what the harbor plan amendment that will be necessary uh, will uh, include. And that process, the, the amendment process, will follow what we're uh, engaging in this evening. Lastly, uh, the executive office uh, has uh, hired uh, the firm of Brown, Richardson and Rowe and uh, their subcontractor, the engineering firm Stantec. Uh, it, it, th those two firms, and we're going to hear from them uh, this evening to talk for the most of the evening, uh, and they are the ones who will be working on behalf of the city of Lynn uh, to engage in this planning exercise, to work through the opportunity with you and to realize uh, the outcomes. And uh, so I'm grateful to be here. I'll be here throughout the evening, and with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Clarissa Rowe, Brown, Richardson, and Rowe, uh, to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, who are we? Uh, Brown, Richardson, and Rowe is a firm of landscape architects, and we have specialized for almost 35 years in public waterfronts in urban areas. So we're very excited about Lynn. These are a couple of pictures of work that not only was planned but built, one in East Boston on the left, and on the right, something that was just finished through Kurt's program in Fall River. It's important to get families and children to the waterfront. You have a tremendous opportunity, and while there are some potential issues, they are ones we should be planning for now. This is a picture of Spectacle Island, which is in the middle of the Boston Harbor. It was an old garbage dump, and it is now a park that you can go out to every summer with wonderful views back to Boston, kind of like the views you have from Lynn to Boston. It's a tremendous resource. This is what Lynn could have. And what we're going to do tonight is really walk through. Dave Andrews has put together a great slide presentation of really specifics about what each area, including the ferry terminal area and the um, Lynn State Heritage Park, and try to get your ideas. This is the beginning meeting. We plan to have more meetings, um, but I'm going to turn it up right over to Dave and let him begin. And then we'll have your questions afterwards. If anybody needs uh, Spanish language 
a translation, please raise your hand. Great. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having us and um, and, the, and the great turnout tonight. Um, as Clarissa said, you know, the, the biggest thing that we're trying to do is find ways to activate the waterfront um, and connect it to downtown. Um, and so what we're going to do is, this is the first of what's going to be four larger scale public meetings. Um, and then, but in between them, we're going to have smaller breakout meetings. So maybe it's site walks, the different parts of the site, maybe it's a focus group, or maybe it's with individual um, community groups just to talk about it in a bit more detail and to make sure that we're getting everybody's input properly. Um, so it's a, we'll outline this a little bit later, um, but we also kind of want to design this public engagement process with you. So any ideas or things that make it easier for people, please let us know. Um, and as everybody's mentioned, this really is about disengagement. Um, what's going to make, what makes any good park or public space is that it's been designed around um, what the local communities really want. And so we're trying to embed all of that now that we have the opportunity to set up this master plan for the waterfront. Um, so I guess it's good to talk about what an open space master plan is compared to other sort of drawings and plans that have been done. Um, and there have been a number of things that, um, reports that have been made over the years also about this waterfront. Um, and what we're trying to do is focus on um, things like you know, parks on the water, promenades along the water's edge, public space where people can go and gather at night and different times of day, different activities people can do. Um, and so it's all about <coughs> You know, find you know, locating approximately where these are going to go. Understand the size of these different types of spaces based upon what seems to work with the local community and your ideas and what you know from being out here. Um, and so we'll try to stitch all these ideas together and come up with this kind of broad scale plan of where all these pieces of the puzzle fit. And so we're effectively making a, a structure or a spine from which all the development that's going to be happening that may or may not be happening along there can, um, I guess, use as their, almost the outline of what they're going to do. That's kind of the guidelines that they're going to be um, following when it comes to open space and public space. So that's the gist of what we're, what we're, our end product after all these different public meetings is going to be. Um, and I guess maybe it's a good place to start is what makes a great waterfront? Um, and to us and the work we've done and things that we're, we experienced is it's all about having a multiple variety of different things to do at different times of day for a whole range of different people. So it's, a, it's not just one thing, you know, one park or one gathering space or one pathway along the edge. It's about being able to have different options at different times of day um, and really just maximizing all these activities and uses. And it's about programming the uses that happen along the water's edge and tying it into the city's history and um, getting people down to the water's edge and being able to touch it. Because it's not something that Except for, say, Lynn Heritage State Park, if you've been there, you can almost get to the water, but not quite. And so how can we get that access? You know, how can we use the water, you know, beyond the water? It's a relatively calm bay there, so there's opportunities for that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's also, as we'll talk a little bit more, um, there's a lot of erosion of the waters of the existing seawall. Um, and we can start to look at how this water's edge can help um, stabilize that coast and how we can take advantage of it through use of things like living shorelines, uh, maybe rebuilding existing wall in certain areas where it's right. So we'll look at, as part of the process, we'll look at a variety of options um, that best suit different parts of the site for how we can um, stabilize the edge, which we'll, you'll see some pictures a bit later of, of what I'm referring to. Uh, so we'll take a step back briefly just to look at how this um, area of the city was actually formed. Um, the old water's edge, you know, you see in the blue line, was quite curvy as it goes through, and it's all effectively um, formed by the water, you know, tides coming in and out. And at, over time, you know, you start to see where the city was, has filled in the land. And these parts here were generally for industrial uses, say mid-century, um, you know, there's a lot of you know, that was a primary use on that water's edge, this filling into the harbor. Um, the city itself is up against it in some areas, um, but I feel like over time, the, air, you know, the, the harbor itself has receded, the seawall was pushed out, 
Um, just looking here, uh, this is an old, kind of an old map, green showing old marshland, blue is the old harbor. You can see estuaries that were formed in there and the, a much more winding edge of the city. Um, over time, this is now the line of the waterfront edge. And that's how much the city has filled out over the years. And so this is a, a key piece um, to be aware of. There's also regulations that um, define how you can develop in what's called filled tidelands. Um, and so this kind of pulls all those together. You'll see our site outlined in blue, defined by the Linway on the north side, the harbor on the south side. Um, with the old marshland and the old harbor that was old water that used to be there, but it's now filled land. Um, so today's condition, this is where we're at now, um, or say mid-century, you know, maybe 1960s, 70s, they built the seawall, but since then it's been eroded behind the seawall just from the water coming in on different storms. And so, you know, this is, uh, this is the um, flea market, here's Walgreens, just get a sense, you know, we've, uh, rarely people go back there very much, and you'll see, looking a bit closer, this is that same, those same areas eroded behind the wall. So we're dealing with these pieces, you know, there's, there's nails and iron and old pieces of wood down there, um, but there's also some really nice spaces carved out by these beaches almost that are still there and views back to Nahant, to Revere, and to Boston. So there's actually some really nice stuff out there. So how do we work these pieces into whatever happens um, in the open spaces along the water's edge? So as we do this, I want to throw out a couple critical factors that are going to influence what we can and can't do or how we can do it. And a couple of those are Chapter 91, um, one is a designated port area or a DPA, um, which exists here. Um, also, the effect of rising water levels and, and bigger storm surges and flooding on the site. And all these factors are going to influence how and what we can do. So, Chapter 91. Um, it's an old regulation, uh, I think 1866, when that was actually uh, brought into law, but it basically enshrines the right for citizens to access the water's edge, to use the water itself. Um, and so as we develop, or as developments or private land is um, turned into developments, it is a way to enshrine or to require um, and to um, ensure the public has access to the water. So we'll try to be using these sort of, you actually can use these and leverage this as a way to ensure we get the access. The gray here is indicating our site. That squiggly black line is the, what's called the Chapter 91 line, which reflects the original, the more or less the original shoreline. So you can see how much difference it is now. Um, jump ahead to some flooding impacts. So there's storm surges. So in, in a very big storm, um, there is, you know, water coming into the site. Um, is also tidal. So an average high tides or, or extreme high tides affecting the site. I will look quickly, just kind of walk through this really quickly. Um, there was a Weston and Sampson engineering company did a report last year about resiliency on the Lynn waterfront. Um, it's up on the EDIC website. Um, and the critical thing is there's, key, there's parts along the water's edge now in this yellower color where just at a high tide, water encroaches into the site um, past that old seawall line. Um, and they projected out 25 years to 2041, and then there are 25 years to 2066. Um, and you show, so in their projections are kind of assuming that rising, sea levels are rising, which, they, which they've calculated and they are, so as time goes on, the impact is greater. Um, you can just see in that red and the orange, if their projections, their extreme projections are correct, there's much more encroachment if you don't touch the site and deal with the seawall in any way. Um, jump a little bit to flooding. So this drawing shows a, what's called a, a 100 year storm, which is, you know, it's a very big storm that we probably all have experienced at some stage in our lives. Sometimes it's not necessarily a hurricane or something like that, or even a storm that's been named, but heavy rain for over sustained periods, often uh, combined with really high tides, can create what's defined as a 100 year storm. Uh, the way they calculate this is, it just says that, um, you know, it could happen two years in a row, doesn't mean it won't happen in 100 years, but it's just a measurement of a, a very large scale storm and, and with a lot of water. Um, it says basically this could happen, uh, it's 1% chance per year this could happen. Um, but the critical thing here to look at is the blue, which is the current existing um, likelihood of this flooding on the big storm 
this is how much, you know, here's the Linway somewhere buried here. Here's the commuter rail line on the GE site. You know, there's a potential for water to creep in. And I'm sure you've seen in different high king tides of last year or other events, you've seen water floating on different streets. And this is kind of what that's, what's, what's that's showing. Is that, so that's a real issue that's there. Um, and also FEMA maps, if you're aware of them, define this almost the whole site as a floodplain. So that's something we can, um, and this is projection further out um, 50 years from now, just showing, um, you know, this gets even more extreme as time goes on. Um, and these are the king tides we're referring to. You know, this is Western Ave and Hathaway Loading Dock and Canal Street parking area. So, you know, you see the water has already approached these areas uh, in, during certain events. Um, and the point is that these things may become more frequent. So how can we use the waterfront edge as part of the parks to help defend against some of this? And that's something we can look at. Um, another more regulatory-based um, site consideration is designated port areas. Um, and this is, there's a portion of the site which is called, which is a designated port area, and basically um, the uses you can develop and do in there have to be strictly marine-based for, for marine-based commerce. So it could be processing and manufacturing plants, um, but all to do with marine-based uses. Um, and this picture here just kind of shows a part of the site where this black line is the DPA, um, you know, the liquid natural gas tank. Here's the ferry terminal, which is which uh, satisfies this DPA definition. There's other uses down here, other piers um, and uh, processing areas that um, are current use, but a lot of this area, just to point out, is unused in any way. Um, but having said that, we still have to adhere to this outline, this boundary, and, and what we can do. Um, touch briefly, and Jim touched on this as well, is this blue is privately owned land, the pink is publicly owned land like um, DCR or um, EDIC or City of Lynn. Um, and the yellow is public utilities, so Mass Electric or National Grid owns a fair portion of the site. Um, so these are the, as we do anything we're going to be doing, we're going to have to be discussing and collaborating with all these groups throughout the process. So it's not like we own all the land, we can do whatever we want. There is, there is a process we'll have to go through. Um, and um, I just want to point out all how different pieces of land are set up, noting that this is Lynn Heritage State Park up here and um, this is the South Harbor site with the fishing pier. Um, I should have mentioned back in the beginning of all this, and I think Kurt touched on it, was that it's a master plan process where we look at the whole of the waterfront. There's also kind of a separate stream which is looking at these two DCR pieces of land and coming up with the actual design, a concept design for each of those pieces. So we'll get into that more when we define the public uh, meeting process, but I just want to <coughs> highlight those parts um, as we go through. Um, so I'm going to zoom into the site here. As we know it, this is the, our site that we're looking at. A couple key areas, City Hall, downtown area, um, the community college, uh, Market Street and Pleasant Street, and Lynn Commons up here along the top. Um, so I think, you know, like I said, the ferry terminal, Lynn Heritage State Park, and the fishing pier at General Edwards Bridge. And what we're going to be trying to do is link all these pieces that are there, Neptune Park and a future um, tea station that might happen at, um, at GE and potential new Lynn Community Bike Path which might reuse the old abandoned um, rail line. So these are potential new products that are coming up and how do we stitch all this together um, as well as looking at how we link the waterfront itself all along the side. And this is jumping out around that DPA area I was talking about. Um, and so, like I said, it's about connecting, you know, down hall and city, downtown and city hall, um, community college to the water, you know, down certain streets from Lynn Common, um, through neighborhoods and, and Neptune Park, and how do we make these clear, obvious, and safe access across the Linway? Um, this is a critical barrier we need to cross, and how do we do that in a safe and inviting way? Um, some of these topics that will come up aren't necessarily everything we can resolve in this process, but it's all about identifying and trying to map out how we get there in the end. Um, you know, linking through future, um, you know, which may become a future um, housing and offices as well as the T station and, you know, potentially along, along the estuary's edge underneath the bridge. Um, this part here, we want to jump to looking at a couple key areas on the site that we have just initially identified. And we may find more as part of this process, but the, a couple of uh, spaces or areas have jumped out as certain potential. One being the South Harbor site. 
Um, there's a development site to the rear, um, but public easements and DCR easements, and DCR owned parking area and DCR owned, DCR owned fishing pier all on this site. So how do we get access from parking areas and through some of these, um, you know, down to the fishing pier itself? Um, a central area, which is the old landfill, which has been capped. Um, and how do we, you know, is there an opportunity to transform this into a park, as Cliffs was saying, say it was done at Spectacle Island, and there's n numerous examples of converting old landfills into public spaces and public parks. Um, this is the ferry terminal, um, which is uh, proposed to have a ferry terminal building on that site uh, right next to the existing parking lot and ferry dock. You know, and is there ways to um, increase some of the activities that happen at that site? right on the water's edge. And finally, uh, Lynn Heritage State Park, which we've discussed, um, and coming up with some new ideas how to enliven that space and make it something that's more used and better access from different parts of the city. So we'll dive into each of these quickly in a bit more detail. Um, first being that South Harbor site. These little triangles here are pointing in the direction that the photo is taken, just to clue you in. Um, but these sites are right on the water's edge, and they're they can be great spaces. Um, they're a little bit, um, sometimes you, you know, there's, you have to take small paths to get down there. You're behind a lot of planting and, and overgrown shrubs. So it's about maybe opening up access, making it more public and inviting. You know, there's areas that are great potential to cut through. You know, it's, the picture looks like one, but what you can do with these spaces, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, this begins to show a little of the seawall that's there and how it's starting to degrade and also how it's, you know, has been broken through here, and this is naturally formed just by the tides coming in and out in storms. And that's the fishing pier in the rear. So it's about weaving and getting access through um, different spaces. This particular site, like I said, is a more, it's a narrower site in that this larger area is all privately owned, as is this. So if development happens, we maybe have a smaller piece up front. And so how we look at that is trying to, you know, this is a, really basic section which slices through uh, you know a theoretical part of the site and how we might be dealing with the water's edge as the main piece of our work um, you know having a promenade but maybe other ways to get access behind some of these seawalls that are in safer spaces to get access to the water's edge jumping moving down the coastline a little bit was that landfill area which we talked about um, here's the old landfill um, here's the sewage treatment plant these are things we really need to consider what happens in these spaces. But there's also the old Riley Way um, that already runs down there. Moving down, this is some of this is quite a large beach. This is about 75 feet um, receding back to the road itself. Um, it's already eroding, it's like taking away the road itself as it is. But these are potential areas um, to capitalize on. And again, you know, are there ways to get pads that go up the hillside, you know, and have open spaces, places people can gather and, you know, for recreation, as well as really nice, big, wide spaces down by the water. So we'll be looking at different ways, different options, you know, meadow planting or, you know, how we get, um, you know, a harder edge rather than a softer edge, you know, the different ways we can, we can look at it. Um, moving up to the ferry terminal. Um, it's a few photos now looking back at the ferry dock itself. Um, there is a pretty open site that's here, which is where the ferry terminal is proposed to be. Um, but maybe it's a chance to look at this space along the water. Um, and what are some ideas, where are some potential for getting people down there? And so this is kind of throwing out ideas here. Could you have cafes or, uh, you know, an activity area or a, um, you know, um, different things that get people down in the water at different times of day, you know, roller skate rental to go along a big boardwalk, you know, water's edge, you know, renting kayaks. How do you increase the number of activities that are happening down there? Um, there's also potential to look at, say, short-term things that we can do sooner than later to actually start using some of these spaces. Land ownership is a key critical part of that, but maybe as we go through and engage different parties, we can start to see who's willing and able to um, you know, allow access down to certain parts of the site for just um, to start to get that access for everybody um, now rather than long term. And then lastly, I just want to look at um, Lynn Heritage State Park. Um, the existing park, if and you know, but it's quite underused. Every time I've gone down there, there's no one there. You know, there's parking, and this lot at the community college is often full, but and this is half full, but there's not really much going on there. And so how do we get 
you know, it's a great spot. There's beautiful views back out over the water, and this is a really nice calm cove. So what are ways we can activate this park, even in its current form? Um, but also, we're looking at maybe coming up with a new program of uses and a new layout of, of some of the spaces. Just to throw out one more bigger critical piece is that this seawall, too, is eroding. It's kind of hard to see in these photos, but if you go down there, the seawall edge is doing this winding up and down. And what it looks like is when they built the seawall, it's starting to settle, starting to sink a little bit. Some of the paths are winding. And so, you know, they're big hurdles, but this is part of this, what this process is to identify them and come up with ideas and prioritize what we can do um, to, to make things better and to improve it and to get people down there. Um, and you can see some of that winding of the area. You might be able to see here how this is dipping up and down. This is that settlement that's happening. Um, but again, you know, what can we do? Can we have outdoor movies? Can we get people down to the water's edge um, and really start to activate these spaces? So I think the, the big idea for us is today is just to meet everybody, to talk about what we're trying to achieve. Um, but we really, really need everybody to, you know, come up with ideas and come back to us and work with us to help figure out what we should do, what works for you, what would be great to have down there, um, what would make people start to come down to the waterfront. Um, and we're going to try to, like I said, have a series of meetings, like big scale like this, where we talk in big groups, um, but then smaller scale meetings where we go out to maybe some of these four sites and have a walk for an hour or half hour, walk around the site so you can see what it's really like out there, and then come back to a bigger setting like this and you know, sit over some drawings and talk over and what we, you know, come up with ideas and, you know, write those down and record those. We'll then build those into a bigger plan and come back with ideas that we've had, that you've had, um, and present some drawings about what may or could, you know, could or could not happen. So, I'm not going to go through each different piece of this, but the idea is that there's a number of meetings we're going to have and a number of follow-up um, smaller meetings we're going to have. In blue, that's a whole um, set of meetings that might go for the Lynn Harris State Park parcel and the South Harbor parcel for, with DCR. And so that will have its own track of meetings. But to start, we're here today just to kind of give the overview and really just to start to listen to your experiences and your things and your desires that um, are really going to make this waterfront, you know, really connected to downtown and, to, and, and usable for everybody here. So um, with that, I just want to say, you know, please let us know some comments. We have drawings to talk about. We have, um, you can just ask questions. This is being recorded, so if you don't want to have your question recorded, there's pads of paper over there to write your questions down. Um, however you want to do it, we set up a Facebook page to start, if there's, uh, which is listed here. If there's better ways to communicate, let us know, and we'll try to build that in. Um, through talking to you tonight, maybe we'll ha find out better forms of communication. So um, at, at that, I'll say thank you very much for listening, um, and if you have any questions, please let us know. And one of the things I'll say at the very beginning is this is an open space and we're talking about parks and promenades. Uh, I know there are a lot of people here who have a long history with the waterfront and we really want to hear from you. We're not going to be talking about development parcels and we're not going to be talking about housing on the waterfront. We're just the open space people. So if you have comments about that, talk to other people but not us. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> but we would love to hear from you. Um, so raise your hand. Yes, sir. I, I just want to make a couple of comments. I think this is great what we're doing here. And I want to thank you guys and Jim for doing this. Just a, a couple of things that I think uh, Heritage State Park, when it first opened, uh, got a lot of use. And it got a lot of use because we're allowed to use the college to park. That's why the bridge was built. So now it doesn't get much use because there's no parking. You know? so, so it satisfies the chapter 91 requirement, but it, it, you know, at the time, so it could be constructed, but really doesn't get any use at all. So when we're going through these, I think that's something that we should keep in mind because uh, you, know, you can satisfy the chapter 91 requirement uh, right now, but is it going to ensure that the public will be able to use it in the future? So that's just something I think that we should think about. Uh, the other thing, so just one thing, and then uh, uh, the the, uh, the ferry 
uh, area right there with the parking lot. I know we talked about it a little bit. We talked to Jim and Pat. That EDIC lot uh, right next to it is, is just prime space. And I know there's a lot of interest in the community in being able to use that space because there is parking right there. And it is something that you can do right away. You might be able to do something similar to what they have down in Sable Pillows. You know, if it was all grass, people are using the parking lot now in the summertime to sun up, you know, sit in the sun and fish up. Off, uh, off the edge there. So I, I think that would be like something right away, easily, that we could do. We could also have like a, a, a blow up driving th drive in theaters where you could see movies, you know, in the parking lots right there. So, and that, you know, the, I think people would use it, you know, uh, a lot more than every state park. You know, I'd like to solve that problem too with the parking, but, uh, you know, as far as something really quick and easy that we could do, especially until the ferry terminal was there, you would have a big open space that people could use. So. No, thank you. And, uh, as you can tell from Dave's presentation, we completely agree with you. Because it's, it's uh, you know, people just get into the water and having the parking lot there, and when the ferry is going in and out, it's going to be short. Because people love to look at boats, they love to look at water. So we'll, we'll see, maybe we can have some sort of partnership for something in the summer. We would love to do that. You know, I don't have any money, but I would contribute to it. I want to say about the DCR parcels, as you know, the state and DCR, with the budget cuts, has been severely understaffed, and they know they have a problem. They are, we're trying to help them with it, but we need to be patient, and I think that Secretary Beaton knows about it, and you know we're hoping that with this, the spark of this project, that we can generate the interest to make sure that the budget dollars are there. Thank you for coming. And if you're asked a question, if you just state your name first, just so everybody, so everybody knows, it'd be great. So. Um, you uh, have visuals. Mm -hmm. You had uh, the um, community bike path yep. coming down. And um, I'm assuming that there are um, I didn't see it on the map. Is there any, and this is not, I know, part of in your parcel exactly, but um, getting up over the Linway, uh, is there maybe some of the officials here know it? Will there be some kind of uh, or pedestrian overpass or something? There was, I mean, um, there was a study done as well, I think just last year, um, that presented a number of options, and I don't know exactly where it has landed um, with the city to take options or to fund different options, but that is something, even though, yes, that site's out of our outline, but those connections are really important, so, you know, prioritizing and finding them is key, um, and also suggesting which ways to get over Linway are preferable is something that, you know, we should we should consider, you know, so. Here, are there the other, some of the other visuals, like the, that picture of, Terrible graffiti, but uh, going under the bridge, it, mm -hmm. uh, it just seems like the other side of the bridge. I, I don't know the um, there was the uh, article and the picture and the items recently. Yeah. Um, and again, that's not part of what you're talking about, but um, but that's waterfront. Is that going to be connected into? Waterfront under the bridge that could bring them the bikes through. I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't have the the bikeway at the moment is just an idea, but they did contact us early on before it went public to say how are the connections going to be handled. And the report that Dave mentions is a Mass DOT MAPC report. It's an excellent report, um, and I think that. You know, trying to get across the Linway from the rest of Lynn is one of the biggest challenges we have. Yes, yes. Um, I, did, I also want to add to that, um, the item had an, an art, uh, uh, editorial or an article about um, the, um, uh, uh, oh, the, uh, the problems that they had in Linfield uh, bike path. <coughs> And that's not what I'm referring to, but at the bottom of that column, they 
Fred talked about the um, Carlos bike path in Lynn, which is complete except for Lynn, and saying something to the effect, I've got it with me, but something to the effect that didn't know how much interest there was in West Lynn, because that's where it's coming through. And I think there's a lot of interest. I mean, I just happened to drive down, I don't know, know the name of the street, but I, I looked down the little side street, and there's the wall along the railroad tracks where they painted the mural. Peter, you know what street that is? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, these people are like getting ready for it. So I just wanted to make clear that uh, there is a lot of interest in it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, could you say your name? Sorry, just sir. Could you stand up so we can hear? Yeah, you? sir. Um, she makes a lot of good points about connectivity, and there's not only connectivity coming from Linfield and from the West, but there's connectivity from the South and the people like that way and on the sidewalks. And that gets to a bigger image of the image of problem that. Lynn has at that point where she designated as South Harbor, but that's really the gateway of the city in the land. And, and there's a you know, beautiful wooded area there from afar. Um, and then you're on top of the wooden part and the you know, But um, I think, yeah, addressing the connectivity. Thank you. We saw a, a guy on a mountain bike on the sidewalk. It was, it was like a road bike in his gear, having to be on the sidewalk, you know, <laughs> because the road itself was too, <laughs> wasn't safe enough. <laughs> yeah, there is. Thank you. There was a question over here. Sorry to skip you, but he had his hand up earlier. Sorry. Yeah, you. Yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm Jeff Brown. We have a Christmas street in there, and the executive director of a group called Lenin Lane Coalition. It's a, it's a union to community folks. Um, we spent all ten organizations. We spent the last year and a half doing a visioning process to kind of find out amongst our members what people would like to have you know, out of the development that's exciting everybody and that's about to change in hopefully in a uh, you know, in a really big way. And one of the things that came back to us it was actually not on our agenda going in that we were asking people about housing and transportation. So what came back was the fourth point. Um, which was um, green space and something ecologically sustainable. And a lot, some of the folks from other countries, they had seen what happened in places like the Dominican Republic, for example, when it got wiped out by development that wasn't planned with that in mind. The people who really felt strongly that they wanted to have a, a family space on the waterfront, with picnic tables, places where you could come, um, bring family, have social events, uh, with access from the rest of the city, which was explicitly not a part of the original Sasaki discussion, because I went to those meetings from 12 years ago. And, um, and also with parking. And Lynn Mary State Park has some of that. I actually, until I saw that, I didn't realize how much of it faces the water. Just, I think it's not designed for really that, I don't know. But the parking situation there, as he said, is really prohibitive. I've tried to organize some major events there. They just can't get there if the, the community college is using their own parking, which they often aren't, so they're growing this institution. So uh, what I've seen so far is, the best I've been able to find, looking at things like the plans for what people call the old Beacon Chevrolet site, um, it's something called a linear park, which to me, like a boardwalk with a bench, is not what I think of as a park. So, you know, it's not like a part of the facts or something. So, but I'm, I'm hoping that we get an actual park that has access and parking for folks who, who already live here or be able to draw for drawn to and use the waterfront. So thanks for your time and all this and I um, hope to stay involved with you and doing this kind of thing. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Isaac Simon Bose. I live in Ward 7 in Lynn. Um, I think I'm a community organizer uh, here in the city. I'm, I'm off the clock so I'm speaking uh, as a long time
so people really want to see a park um, that meets the needs of families and people from all over the city, um, not just one particular park um, that addresses um, you know, the desire for things like basketball courts or soccer fields, um, for playgrounds for young children, as well as just sort of open grass space. And as a soccer player who's um, braves commercial street fields, um, which are like incredibly dangerous because of some of the potholes, like that's something that's really close to my heart. Um, I also just wanted to quickly note, I know that <coughs> this is not about housing, but I think the context matters, and a concern that's been raised is that if we end up with a situation where all of the housing along the waterfront is intended for wealthier people from out of town, and it's not integrated, and there's not any kind of inclusionary component to that, it's going to be really tough to make the open spaces genuinely accessible and inviting. And we've seen in other places where technically it's open to the public, but in terms of the feel of it, in terms of the perception of the public, it seems um, privatized in some ways. So that's a concern um, that I hope we can address going forward. Um, and I, just in addition, I, I just have one question. And in terms of the process that got us here, um, I really appreciate the, the long process of creating the existing harbor plan and, and the other plans in place. Um, one thing that that planning process produced was a design for what was referred to as a signature park. And that was considered by, I think, the public and as well as um, by the secretary approving that plan um, to be very important to the plan, and, you know, just looking at the decision of the secretary, quote, creation of a unified series of public spaces and the creation of a signature park uh, for stated community events are central to the plan. So that was really important. And when development recently sort of reunited inland, the very first, um, I think, development to move forward um, you know, the, the developers, and you know, their role is primarily to make money. They decided that it would be more advantageous to them um, to ignore that signature part and to do something else with that space. And to me, it was very troubling and incredible that our own uh, EIC then went to the state on their behalf and said, hey, let's let them throw the signature part <coughs> out the window. And I think that's kind of a slap in the face to the people that took part in that. And I guess what I'm looking for is, uh, and this is the Beacon Shuttle Lake site, um, and I guess what I'm looking for is some kind of reassurance or, or clarification about whether this process will matter. Um, because to me, that really circumvented the whole idea of an MHP, which is you have a municipal harbor plan, which is you have public input, and that's the plan going forward. And if you want to change it, that's fine. Conditions change. But the whole idea of the democratic process is that if you want to change it, go back to the public first. Don't preempt that. So I, I hope you can reassure us that this process will really matter um, because I think it is important. And I appreciate that. So uh, Secretary Beaton and his uh, basically all allowing the amendment uh, specified that a public process take place, that the open space on the waterfront be addressed, and the funding being provided and the outcome of this process is specifically intended to help uh, address those circumstances, provision of public open space on the waterfront. So this, this is very much uh, intended to help think through, work through issues of provision of that kind of public open space on the waterfront. I, I appreciate that and thank you. But I guess the, the, question, the, the concern is still, that was the central part of the old plan. What if the central part of this new plan doesn't fit the needs of the developer? And I hope we can pull the line and make this really um, something that's, that's binding and can last until the public again decides to change that. So chapter 91 has come up a couple of times in this conversation. It essentially guarantees public access to certain filled tidelands on the waterfront. And the, par the uh, harbor plan is, in some ways, essentially saying we want relief, we want some change from what Chapter 91 would otherwise, otherwise require. And in, the, in a process to come, following this open space planning exercise, we're going to get into a process of amendment of the existing harbor plan. And the question will be asked, does the city of Lynn need any relief from the otherwise applicable rules of Chapter 91? 
uh, that chapter 90, those chapter 91 rules do require the provision of public access and open space on those filled tidelands. And in, to the extent that that sort of relief is required, then we'll be looking for those sorts of, okay, if you're going to build uh, something in a portion of the waterfront zone that otherwise wouldn't be allowed under Chapter 91 and are doing and need, therefore, to provide additional open space somewhere else, uh, the idea is to, to sort of memorialize that through the amendment to the harbor plan. So, yes, that's the idea here. And frankly, we're not interested in doing another report that sits on a shelf. Um, we've read all those reports. We'd like to actually see something, you know, it'd be great if we can find some sort of grant, you know, maybe through mass development to do some pop-up something at the ferry terminal area so that there is a way of getting, I think the more people you get to the waterfront, and that's why in the future public meetings we want you to come to the waterfront and to look at it. And the more people use that waterfront, the old uses and the way people have used it in the past start changing. So we hope you'll continue to be involved. Thank to your input earlier. <laughs> yeah, we we completely agree. And Fran Smith this morning at five of nine told me that we she did want a translator, and we have provided one today. And um, we don't usually work that fast, <laughs> so we would like to have advanced knowledge, like a week. Sure. That's so if we could do that in the future, that would be helpful. And also we, maybe having some notice out in other languages as well to help. We would love Absolutely, to do that. Absolutely, yeah. And Language Connections, which is the company we use, can certainly do that. Yeah. So. And I do have a, one other thing that I'd like to say. Uh, as someone who spent so much time and energy focused on the development of the Flint's waterfront, um, I was think if there's a way for us to approach green space, not just as a passive recreational space, but also to look at this as an opportunity for economic development that would really benefit our city. Uh, he brought up Sam Willows earlier. I think that's a great example of people who have a ton of youth employment, a lot of locally owned small businesses that have space to really thrive and serve not only as a home for tourist money, but also as a place where locals have, have a home to engage, uh, have a place to spend the day in the sun, have a place to bring their families. Um, and I think there's a number of spaces in this waterfront that will work for that. I'd love to see you some more about that. Great. Sounds great. We like your background. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that's very important, groundwork, um, the groundwork, Lawrence and um, Somerville, have been really, it's a wonderful organization, and we should probably try to get something like that started in Lynn or, or get them to come in, because they have a wonderful way of programming youth in these open spaces. If you go to their website, the Groundwork Lawrence website, and look at how the youth of Lawrence is really out there doing cleanups, doing putting community gardens together, that's the kind of thing that we really need to do in order to involve the youth because the, you have to know about people my age. We all go to meetings. The younger people don't come to the meetings because they've got better things to do. <laughs> But we, we hope to get them out, and that's why we have a Facebook page. And who knows, we might have Twitter soon. <laughs> so this question, sorry, this question back there, and then you, we'll go over to you guys. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Beatty. Uh, I am a member of the Lincoln Park Community Development Council. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Lincoln Park Community Development Council. That's a critical issue of what we're talking about here. Uh, you can look at similar kinds of developments and one 
closest to us right now is uh, uh, Mystic Mall and, and the one friend. When you drive by it, you drive by it. Even when you drive into the development, you are kind of like steered away from a spectacular river walk. And we have an opportunity down here to learn from that mistake. So whatever's being planned, and I love hearing about that signature park, after the park down on the uh, waterfront, and uh, if you let me draw it on the map, I, I put it down there at the corner, but it's not my fault. But that kind of, uh, uh, to get the kind of use and activity on that kind of facility, we have to lead people into it. It's a simple planning technique that we overlook, you know, all too often. Other things to keep in mind is that uh, that Riley Way was put in, in at that location for a reason. That was to protect public access. That fishing pier was, uh, I don't want to call it excess state money at the time, but it was money that we had a better, better idea of how to use it than the state did at the time. And uh, that fish pier was put there for a reason as well. And that's to protect the principles of Chapter 91, in fact, as opposed to the speeches that get made about those kinds of principles. So in fact, uh, you know, we were able to do that. But I think that the whole issue of connectivity is a critical one. Uh, it requires significant uh, design and, uh, and work with current property owners. But it is so important to the success of this overall concept. We really can't let that go you know, To make the connections all the way down to uh, the yacht clubs and down to the uh, causeway is really where we need to get to. I, I can tell you that that fight uh, to, uh, to design the Heritage State Park the way it is to take development off the street and out onto the, you know, get, get as much open space as we could, that was a tough fight. And uh, the other one that almost came to my lows was in the pedestrian overpass, connecting public properties to public properties. And there were, you would see a lot of people using that overpass back when there was a volunteer group at the business center. They were incredibly active. There's still some embarrassing pictures of me. <laughs> see, uh, see, sir, I love them. <laughs> but that was the result of what you were talking about. And that's pretty good. But it, really, I do, I do want to make that point about connectivity from the Linway to the water. It's critical. Thank you. So one here, and then you come back to you. So my name is Rolf Floor. Uh, I live here, and then I work in Lynn. Um, and my credentials are primarily that I like the open space, and I like to walk it. Um, and I, I think of the places I go to, first of all, I do go to the north, I go to the Causeway right away, because it's a beautiful walk. Um, and it seems to me that uh, some way of connecting the things over so that there would be some continuity in that direction would be really nice. Uh, one thing I've noticed when I walk on the Causeway, though, is it's a it's a fairly tight space, and so bikers and pedestrians and uh, families with carts and carriages have to all kind of stay on the same space. So some kind of I'm not saying we're gonna it has to be perfectly organized, but some kind of recognizes the different uses. So a promenade that is just for walking and that is on the Causeway would be difficult. But the second thing I, I do when I, when I get tired of walking that place is I drive all the way down to the Island, which I think is also successful example of reusing things like old landfills and things like that, um, they too have a parking issue, going back to that parking point. And, uh, and they create a little parking space right there that's constantly full because people love to walk there. And now they've had to create a new space to open that up right next to it and they've added, started adding parking. So I definitely think access to the reasonable place to park would be really important. Um, and then to, to address some of the issues about reaching out to young kids, I, I'd say there are some really creative places that are sort of off the beaten path. I, I imagine you've already seen it, but I'm not sure if other people have it. If you look what they did under the Lenny Zaken Bridge, um, and that area right along there, pretty interesting things. They Thank created a, a, like a park for kids to skate and board. Yeah. And, and it, it's yes. like, yeah. open yeah. skate park really great. Yeah. Soccer fields great. Right. But there are kids, things that are kids that are doing nowadays that aren't quite the same. And the parks that they are meeting and looking for will look a little different than just an open space. I think picnic tables and green fields are great, but different kinds of hardscapes built in there for uh, active use by uh, younger people 
uh, have been designed in really creative ways in, in places like that. And, and maybe some of those really creative places would be worth doing an outing to. Like, that is really, if you've ever walked along that, in addition yeah. to the <laughs> space right under the London Taken Bridge, that's just a unique park for skateboarding, really, and biking and things like that, there's all kinds of walkways along there that they've designed. I imagine that they were relatively expensive and maybe outside of our price well, range. Well, you know, the, the one with the funny light poles? Yeah. We did that. Oh, well, <laughs> and one of the things about it is it, it sparked development of the skate park. Yeah. And that's the thing that we're trying to do. It's, an, it's going to be an incremental change. But that, and of course that was big, big money. But, um, you know, those wonderful light poles, everybody goes by them and says, what is going on down there? And the yellow that's because it's dark under there, you know, that's that's what we have to start doing in order to get people back down to the water. If I could add just one more thing to my laundry list, I'm sorry, but um, I, I think that having some kind of art, if you notice the area by Heritage Park where those um, those condo complexes are, if you ever walk around there, there's some really creative looking, I don't know who put them up, I don't know who designed them or what they are, but there's these tile artworks that go up around a good part of that building showing the history of Lynn. They're super cool, they're really interesting, they're relatively large. I don't know how expensive they were to do, but they actually survived the years very well. So the, I, I've been to other cities where they integrate large public art pieces in that, and, and I think that would be helpful for uh, getting people from Lynn engaged in what's built there. And there are, I think there are some um, current projects going on, Lynn, where they're talking about lighting underpasses and, you know, and adding artwork and color to different areas. So some of that is, you know, is kind of happening and you know, adding on to it. Mass development work that's going. We're sorry, as we go along the Linway, we think it would be great to have pieces of art along the Linway that were interesting to draw people in to the waterfront area. This is one question here, and then we'll come back to some other. So. So I think the um, we need to figure out a really good method to communicate with everybody. Um, the idea is the next step we would have individual we would have four site walk meetings to those four sites we showed. Um, we can send out a sign up list and a proposed date um, for those meetings. We wanted to kind of talk to everybody first and engage with different groups and to get more people into this mix uh, before we set a date. Um, but so we'll come back using the Facebook page, um, using, um, I guess, maybe we can use the EGSC website, um, and we have your email list. If you put it on this sheet, we can send a bulk email out to everybody who signed up to let you know when and where the plan is. So we have an individual walk for each of those four sites, right? You know, half hour, hour long, um, and we'll come back to a second big group meeting like this. I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, again, we didn't want to f finalize an exact date um, to get ahead of everybody, but um, we're thinking, you know, three weeks to a month from now, we're back here. And at that meeting, we can build a process, and the goal with them would be to really kind of we'll, um, make a much more detailed and program schedule from there after we've had a chance to talk to everybody and, and make sure everybody's on board. So um, expect that happening maybe in the next um, one and a half, two weeks, we'll have, start having those site walks is the goal. And, and the idea would be to have meetings before school gets out and then not during the summer because nobody, you know, people should be using the waterfront. We'll try to get them down there, but then probably have a big meeting in the fall. Yeah. So sorry, I ignored some people over here. I think you had a question. You had a question. Let me come back over, okay? So... Okay. Oh, sorry. Go back to the map. Public and private ownership. Yep. We'll take your question first, and then. Yeah. Um, my name is Clay Lars. Clay Lars, and I'm with uh, Groundwork Somerville and uh, on Bike to the Sea. Yeah. And um, okay, we're in Lynn. We're extremely happy to work with the city on its idea of a community path in Capano and all. I think we've talked about connectivity a lot. It's, it's extremely important, though. This reminds me, we're doing a lot of work with the Wind Casino Project, right or wrong, whether you support that or not, there's the resources of development 
can drive, you know, it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity to drive the successful vision for this area. So um, and in Everett, it's sort of the Northern Strand Trail is connecting and creating a network of trails. It goes from the sort of regional trail into the neighborhoods. And that's what I see in Lynn is that sort of this sort of regional trail that connects to the waterfront, does a nice little loop around the city. So, you know, I'm excited to see this because this is the opportunity to make that happen. Um, also, we're working on the tree, pl tree planting project in Lynn. So, Groundwork is trying to move to Lynn, and we would love to partner with the city. I know the food project does great work with youth, so right. we look forward to being involved. Thank you. Um, Kurt, so do you want to say something? Yes, if I could just briefly, I don't want to leave folks with one uh, misconception, which is what exactly is publicly owned along the waterfront? And so right now, the South Harbor site is shown with this <coughs> red pub as public ownership. That is a concept we are exploring with the landowner of the South Harbor site. There are, is some public ownership on that site, a parking lot uh, with a DCR ownership and an access easement to the fish pier, but it is not exactly as configured there. We're, this, is, this is a proposal that's been made. We're talking to the landowner, it is not yet reality. So just don't want to leave folks with a misconception here. Thank you. I should explain, that's why it was that light pink. It's a big question mark, but thank you, Kurt. I was beginning to, supposed to mention that. <laughs> um, I lost track a little bit here. Okay. One over here? Okay. And then come back, sorry. Hi, good evening. Oh. Um, my name is Joan LeBlanc. I'm with the Saugus River Watershed Council. And I just want to mention, this is the gateway to the, the Saugus River. That hasn't come up yet. Um, and we're really excited about what's happening here with all this planning. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. Our focus is on protecting and restoring the river. And then the obvious next step of that is getting people out there to enjoy the resource. So we've long been involved with commenting on this piece. Um, we were in on the original planning, the uh, previous plan. We've been commenting on some of the waterfront development such. And we were on, I was on the working group on the resiliency plan as well. So just a couple of initial thoughts. First, great to hear you have a pretty comprehensive uh, plan to get a lot of input over a period of time. I think that's excellent. Um, there were some comments about that there aren't young people here. It's not surprising. I, I think the point was that they don't come to meetings. But there are opportunities to get young people involved with this process. So um, we can talk offline. But, and it sounds like you might have enough time to actually go out into a couple of the schools. We have a lot of education programs where they do that. And you'd be amazed some of the great ideas you get from the kids in the classroom. So maybe that might be an opportunity. Maybe we could bring them down to the waterfront. Right some kind of event on the waterfront that draws people in and get their feedback while they're there. Um, and then you've got the college right there, so maybe a workshop over there to engage some of the kids there. Just a couple thoughts on that. As far as the actual waterfront ideas, things like that, okay, I'm gonna bring up the same thing, connections, because it really is about connections. And it is an opportunity when development comes in. It's an amazing opportunity. <coughs> Prior to working in this watershed, I worked on Boston Harbor and a lot with Boston Harbor Association. So we were very involved with trying to influence what happens along the waterfront when it is developed so that you don't lose it to the people who care about it, to connections both back to the city and out to the water. So that's key. Activation that goes from the land to the sea. So getting people not just looking for somehow engaging on it and boats or the means for walks, Integrating all kinds of different activities, and I think the ideas that people have been bringing up are really exciting. Um, people of all incomes, people of all ages, people of all interests, whether they like to sit on the bench and look at art, or whether they want to do something more active. So that's important to have a, a wide variety of activities. But um, I know you don't want to talk about buildings, and I won't talk about specific buildings, but this, what happens here, we hope, will be a blueprint, or maybe a green print, for when those buildings come down the pipe. And if it's not clear, then it puts the public officials in a very difficult position of how do we really get meaningful public access here. So I think we need to be very clear about the types of open space we want and the connections that we want that the open space to make. So not just a walkway along the park, but rather maybe different types of parks that feed back into the city access that is connected all around the site so you don't just get to a dead end. Places where people can get to by bike, by 
bus, by car, whatever it is. So all of those different connections are going to be really important. I don't want to go on too much because I know there's more people with comments. But um, one final thought on the coastal resiliency piece. A couple things. One um, point is to make sure that the public access is also sustainable. <coughs> And we have a couple of developments that are already in the permitting process and you know without making any particular judgments the efforts on coastal resiliency I, I would say are pretty minimal on those developments so the extent that we can emphasize that in this plan how important it is to make sure everything is sustainable um, both the public spaces as well as the integration of those spaces with the buildings and uh, when you when you get to the more innovative sites those things are intertwined. So oftentimes you have water that might be flowing under a building in a certain circumstance of the floods. So I, I do think there's some integration that we need to not lose more. Thank you. Hi, uh, Wayne Lowe's Ward 1 Counselor. Uh, I represent the third of those part of land from here, but uh, we're uh, just as excited and interested in this as uh, those close to it. And, uh, old enough to remember when uh, as a, a boy going to that area and driving the theater. It was a wonderful time to go there, having a cool ocean breeze. It's a nice, nice thing that we have. Um, we've heard an awful lot tonight. This is awesome where we're headed. Uh, as Jim Cowell said earlier, um, we've, we've come a long way. There's a lot of work here. And I think we still have a long way to go. We've heard an awful lot of good things tonight. Um, there's not too much I can add to that. I don't know if uh, there was anything, any discussion mentioned on water-dependent recreational use, um, as well as uh, connectivity and uh, other parks and, and uh, public access, which is exciting because we're just in this conceptual stage. And I'm looking forward to you folks doing what you're doing and then down the road, seeing the options and alternatives, and then uh, going through this process and seeing it come together. And uh, this is a wonderful thing for our city. And uh, I think I think we have to, you know, all of us, each one of us here, have to be uh, grateful and appreciative that we have this and that we're finally moving it forward to uh, whatever this ultimate conclusion will be. So thank you.